We're coming to you right now from the uh, Eden Hill Chapel. Uh, this is a, a spot, of course, it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I think I'm in my 22nd year of consulting to Eden Hill and training resident physicians, medical students, nurse practitioner students, and geriatric psychiatry fellows uh, here at Eden Hill is truly a special place. So as, as with any uh, lecture given by a, a faculty person in an academic setting, uh, this slide indicates my disclosure. And as you can see here, I have no disclosures to make other than the fact that I am a paid consultant to Eden Hill. However, Eden Hill uh, did not provide financial support to me for this uh, talk today. It's, it's part of my consulting to Eden Hill and I'm, I'm happy to be providing this service. This slide illustrates uh, something I think we're all familiar with, uh, uh, my life broken down into segments. Uh, as you can see, sleeping, working, eating, and then a large chunk just looking for things that I had just a minute ago. A perfect segue into our topic uh, today, we're going to look at some of the early signs and symptoms of dementing illness in, in this slide. Most of you will be familiar with these. Of course, the central feature of dementia is loss of memory. In fact, dementia is taken from the Latin, uh, which literally means out of one's mind. And we'll talk a little bit about that first patient with Alzheimer's disease that was described in 1906. And, and literally she was having symptoms of uh, really severe dementia uh, and paranoia, et cetera. So uh, for many, many years, Dementia has been known as a syndrome that affects not only memory, but behavior and also perceptions. Uh, also, we can see challenges in planning or solving problems, difficulty completing familiar tasks. So, for example, an accountant who may be uh, unable to balance uh, his or her checkbook, um, that's, that would be a, a warning sign of dementing illness, this loss of function. Confusion with time or place, that usually occurs later in the disease. Trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships, we'll talk more about that when it comes to testing. Problems with speaking, writing, uh, judgment difficulties, and then also social withdrawal, uh, apathy, changes in mood and personality. All of these symptoms can be present in dementia. Now, what's important to know is that dementia is really a, a, a term, think of it like a large umbrella, maybe a circus tent. And underneath that uh, tent, there are many, many causes of dementia. This particular slide shows you really what things look like under that, that virtual circus tent, or in this case, a large pie. And you can see that the pie is overwhelmingly occupied by Alzheimer's disease, abbreviated AD here. And then when you take conditions combined with Alzheimer's disease, such as Lewy body dementia or diffuse Lewy body dementia, as it's indicated here, uh, DLB, and then look at Lewy body dementia and vascular dementia combined perhaps with Alzheimer's disease or by themselves, now you, you, you've made up you know, probably 95% of this pie. So these other causes that I've mentioned are really fairly rare causes of dementing illness. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm, I'm often asked by audiences, how do we as uh, physicians discover the cause? Since there are so many causes of dementing illness, what is it that we do to figure out what exactly the etiology is. Well, first of all, we take a very careful history, and, and that's where so many of you in the audience come in handy, because you're here obviously because you have an interest in dementing illness. Many of you probably have a loved one uh, af afflicted with this illness, or you work in a healthcare setting where you serve a lot of dementia patients. So we as geriatric psychiatrists get a lot of our history about our patients from family and friends be, or healthcare providers because often when the illness is diagnosed, memory is impaired so much that it's hard to get a good history from the patient. After a history, we conduct a thorough physical examination and that includes a neurological examination. And part of that neurological examination is a cognitive assessment, really looks at multiple cognitive domains. These are things like memory, 
uh, reasoning, judgment, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those tests in just, uh, just a little bit. And then we also look at patients' functional ability. Uh, can someone continue to take care of their basic activities of daily living? Uh, bathing, dressing, ambulating, toileting and transferring, and can this patient feed him or herself? And of course, prior to losing those activities of daily living, we know that patients will begin to have difficulty with driving or perhaps preparing meals or handling personal finances. Finally, we get some laboratory tests and this slide indicates a number of those tests, everything from a complete blood count to a CT or MRI scan of the brain. And then there are some optional studies that we may get depending upon the patient's presentation, things like an EEG or an, an analysis of patient's cerebrospinal fluid. We may even check for some of those heavy metals that I mentioned earlier if we have a concern about poisoning. When we, when we talk about the cognitive assessment tools, this slide lists some of the more popular ones. The Montreal Cognitive Assessment is now probably the most popular worldwide. It has multiple different versions, a version for the blind, multiple languages, and so this tests for a variety of the, of the issues I mentioned earlier. For example, one of the first items is what's called a trails test. And so the patient is asked to complete a pattern. Uh, they're asked to start with the number one and then connect the number one to the letter A and then connect A to two. So you, you can give yourself a quick trails test right now and complete the pattern one A, two B, 3C and so on, and you'll see patients with demanding illness, they'll, they'll lose track fairly quickly. They'll just start to connect numbers or maybe letters in sequence without going back and forth between numbers and letters. The St. Louis University Mental State is another test, again, not used quite as often anymore, but simple clock drawing can also be used as a screening tool, asking someone to remember three to five items and then have them draw a clock. And, and then of course, while they're drawing a clock, they may forget those three to five items and we'll pick that up. And that is a warning sign of, of demanding illness as well. In fact, here's a clock drawing test uh, here. And you can see that uh, the patient uh, there in the, uh, uh, my, uh, my upper left here, probably upper left on the screen as well. You can see this patient's drawn an, uh, an accurate clock. Uh, showing uh, a good time here, the hands are in the right, right spot. But as uh, the, the patient begins to progress, you can see that the clock becomes more disorganized. Um, the, the time that's supposed to be indicated here is 2.45. And what you see there um, underneath the clock with the eight beneath it is you see a hand drawn to the two and then you see they've drawn a hand sort of between the four and five. So that person has lost their abstract reasoning ability. They no longer understand the concept that nine represents 45 minutes. And that is called an executive function problem or a, or a frontal lobe problem. This part of the brain here controls that higher reasoning. And then at the very end, you see someone has started to write clock down. They've only got the CL and then they put in a nine and they write a 45 there. So very, very severely impaired patient here. Well, so this is, this is an overview that I've given you of dementia, which we now call major neurocognitive disorder. And now we're, we're gonna drill down on, uh, specifically on the most common cause of demanding illness, and that's Alzheimer's disease. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about Alzheimer's disease and, and uh, Dr. Alzheimer. So uh, he is a, a, a German neuropathologist and uh, described this illness in 1907, 1906 or 1907, depending upon uh, who you talk to. And what he noticed in a 51-year-old uh, patient so really someone uh, uh, quite young. Uh, this woman had early onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, the youngest patient I've diagnosed in my practice is actually 48, 48 years of age, devastating to 
uh, develop uh, Alzheimer's at that age, and certainly at any age, really. But uh, Dr. Alzheimer's saw when he looked under the microscope after this, this unfortunate woman passed away, he, he looked at her brain under a microscope and he saw that there were these plaques. And then he also saw there were tangles. And these plaques and tangles are still what we call the central neuropathological feature of Alzheimer's disease all these years later, over 100 years ago. And we, uh, of course, still owe a tremendous debt to Dr. Alzheimer's and his research. Well, what are, what are some of the risk factors for uh, Alzheimer's disease? And really, I should say not only Alzheimer's disease, but really any, uh, any dementing illness. Advancing age, certainly. Uh, we know that at age 60, only about 1% of individuals have a dementing illness. At 65, that's 2%. At 70, it's 4%. At 75, it's 8%. You see the pattern there, it doubles about every five years. So that by the time someone reaches his or her 90s, that uh, risk can be 50% or greater. If there's a family history of dementing illness, that can increase risk. Many of you have probably heard about the, what's called the APOE4 genotype. Um, and that just means if you have two copies of uh, the APOE4 gene, you have a significantly higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. But those, those factors, those risk factors can be modified, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Being overweight uh, and associated insulin resistance, uh, high blood sugar, that's a risk factor, vascular disease, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, problems with blood pressure, increased blood pressure, and certain inflammatory markers. We're hearing a lot about inflammatory markers right now as a reason that some people with COVID have a really terrible and rapid downhill course because the immune system pumps out things called cytokines and other inflammatory chemicals that then cause great tissue damage. So we know that brain inflammation is one way that Alzheimer's disease may be mediated. Uh, Down syndrome also uh, can cause dementing illness. In fact, I often, often ask audiences uh, what percentage of Down syndrome patients will develop Alzheimer's disease. So you can take a moment and see if you, if you can guess the percentage, but depending upon the study you look at, probably somewhere between 75 and 100%, really, if Down syndrome patients live long enough the vast majority of them develop uh, Alzheimer's disease. And then we've talked about traumatic brain injury, of course, as a risk factor as well. As the disease progresses, as you see here in this slide, there can be actually uh, some grace in that. And, and, and an actual case example I'll share with you that, um, that a, a woman had terrible losses in, in her life, uh, um, loss of um, uh, status and home, and business during wartime, uh, loss of a, of a uh, beloved husband who had sort of been her knight in shining armor in the wake of this terrible, terrible catastrophe of World War II, and then lost a son um, and um, was just absolutely grief-stricken every session that, that my team and I had with her. And as her illness progressed, she forgot about all those losses. Um, and she would instead uh, ask, you know, okay, well, where, you know, when's my husband coming to get me and when will my son be here? And the staff was able to work with her through that, not tell her that she had these losses, but to, uh, to explain to her, well, look, before they get here, why don't you join us for dinner and some games, et cetera. And uh, this, of course, would replay multiple times during the day but uh, no longer was she tearful and grief-stricken about all of these losses. In fact, she uh, at, at one point then again be, uh, began asking about her parents, even though she was, of course, you know, in her 80s, about moving back to her home country to be with her parents um, and would, would uh, smile and reminisce about that and staff would use that as an opportunity to, to reminisce with her. So again, in the, in the midst of this devastating disease, there's some grace, and if we can stop and pause and see that, and also sometimes see the humor, and in fact, enjoy uh, humor and laughter with, uh, with our loved ones who are afflicted by this illness, we're all the better for it. 
So uh, to look uh, here at this slide again, mild, moderate, severe dementia, you see it starts off with memory loss, and that is actually even before the diagnosis, we're, we're unfortunately uh, not great at picking up very, very early dementia illness, so that maybe 10, 15 years, even before the diagnosis, there have been some subtle changes. When we make the diagnosis, uh, again, it, it may have been present in the brain for 10, 15, 20 years. We see then a gradual loss of independence towards the moderate stage of the disease. You can see behavioral problems, and it's around this time also that many patients are placed in facilities because of behavior problems or loss of the ability to take care of their toileting needs, for example. That's a very difficult thing to manage at home. And this just reiterates that fact, a progressive loss of activities in daily living, going from mild, where you can still use the telephone, to moderate, where you need help with grooming, and then uh, towards the severe stage of the disease where people need help with, uh, with eating. Average time of diagnosis to death is about 10 years, about 10 years or so. This particular group of slides looks at another way to assess people with demanding illness called the functional assessment and staging, and this is rated from one to seven. Again, similar to what I've just talked about. Stage one, really, we can't see the disease. It's there in the brain, but we don't know it's there because we're not good enough yet at measuring it. Stage two, there's some memory loss that's reported by the patient. Stage three, we can certainly see it on testing. Stage four, complex activities are lost, like again, planning a dinner party, for example. Stage five, individuals start having difficulty with dressing. Uh, stage six, that gets worse, and now toileting is an issue. By stage seven, individuals can no longer speak, they can't talk, they can't even hold their head up by the end of stage seven. And from about stage seven D on, we're really seriously considering a referral uh, to hospice at that point. Well, so a, a, a lot of uh, sobering news, if, if you will, about dementia that we've talked about uh, before, uh, sprinkled in with a bit of humor. Now let's talk about some hopeful news, strategies that, that may help reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease, of dementia, or what we call major neurocognitive disorder. So exercise. Uh, studies show very clearly that exercise is very beneficial. Uh, uh, Meredith Patterson has already spoken to you a great deal about that. She probably let you know that there's a 50% reduction in the risk, according to one study, for people who just walk a mile a day, six days a week. Uh, incredible that we can see that sort of reduction in risk. Um, eating a Mediterranean diet, also known as the MIND diet, that's a specific kind of Mediterranean diet. Uh, essentially, you eat a salad every day, make sure that you have two to three other healthy vegetable servings per day. If you eat an animal, make sure it can swim, cluck, or gobble. If, uh, and then also eat beans, tree nuts, uh, blueberries are very powerful antioxidant compounds. Uh, when you uh, cook, uh, use uh, olive oil as the, the cooking oil. Uh, brain training. Uh, is getting mixed reviews. It depends on the type of brain training, the type of, of brain exercises. Uh, we're still finding more out about that. Certainly avoiding head trauma is very important. So of course, you know, we encourage people to wear seat belts, uh, wear head protection if they're riding a bike, rock climbing, skiing, etc. And then maintaining strong social connections is also uh, vitally important. And of course, that's been a challenge for some people during the age of COVID. That's why I'm not a fan of the term social distancing. Uh, we want to be physically distant. We want to be within a safe physical distance, but we don't want to be socially distant. Um, you, can, you can have conversations via FaceTime or Google Duo or Zoom. Um, uh, you, you can be social and still um, or maintain appropriate physical distance to protect you from COVID. Um, so when it comes to exercise, uh, the uh, doctor here explained, of course, the handle on your recliner does not qualify as an exercise machine. Uh, it's, uh, not, uh, it's, it's a start. It's a start. And I encourage people to do just that. Start with as little as 
five minutes of walking a day and then make that a habit day to day and then you can expand it uh, gradually. This shows actually some of the positive effects on the brain of walking. And you can see here really something quite remarkable. You see these areas of the brain that are really lighting up with these colors. And guess what? These are the areas of the brain that are important for memory, for attention, for concentration, for higher reasoning. So you can actually see improved blood flow. And not only that, you can actually increase the size of your brain measurably by exercise, really, a, an out, a really a, just an awing finding. We had no idea uh, 20, 30 years ago that that was possible, but you can create these new connections. I sometimes use the analogy if my finger here, let's say is, uh, is maybe, there may be 10 neurons there. Um, under the influence of walking, you sprout new connections. So you build these additional bridges in fact, we call that arborization, just like the tree growing branches. You're growing these connections, just phenomenal. My doctor told me to start exercise program very gradually. Today, I drove past a store that sells sweatpants. Again, you gotta start somewhere uh, with your exercise program. Well, so we've talked about these non-medication approaches to diminishing illness. Let's talk about what we have available in terms of FDA approved drugs. And sadly enough, I could have given this same talk 10, perhaps as long as 15 years ago, and it would look very similar. We just have not had numbers of new compounds. I know all of you um, hear news reports about something that's promising uh, in the treatment of demanding illness, and then um, Subsequent studies show that it, it hasn't had the kind of effect that we want. There are numbers of things in the pipeline. Our time today doesn't really allow for that, but uh, research is ongoing. We, wanna, we want to be, uh, I think, robust about funding that research through our support of the Alzheimer's Association. And of course, the National Institutes of Health also is working hard. Uh, so these medications include Dinepazil, which is also called Aricept, Galantamine, called Reminil, Memantine, called Namenda, and Ribostigmine, called Exelon. That last one is available as a patch. So if someone is resistant to taking medications, it can be put on their skin and rotated around um, and so that they can get the benefit of the medication. Because, you know, so many people with Alzheimer's disease and other demanding illnesses say, I don't need to take any medicine, nothing's wrong with me but you can actually put this patch on and they can get benefit. These medications, uh, most of them increase levels of a chemical called acetylcholine, which helps nerve cells communicate and form memories. They're not cures by any means. If we're lucky, they can give someone the memory they may have had two years ago. That's, that's about the best we can do with our medications. Memantine is a little bit different. Um, I use the analogy sometimes that what memantine does, it helps to preserve those nerve cells that are just on the edge of dying or blinking off, if you will. Think of those nerve cells as a, a filament in a light bulb, for example. And when that light bulb that's got a damaged filament is most likely to burn out is when you come into a room and you flip on that switch. You put current through it, and then suddenly that filament burns out. Well, memantine, we think, sort of resets the brain current a little bit. And so it helps to preserve those neurons that are diseased and may be on the verge of, of dying. Uh, its side effects include things like uh, headache, some mild short-term confusion as that, as, as that uh, brain current is reset a bit. And then uh, sometimes people will have a little constipation or dizziness. The other drugs have a very characteristic set of side effects, nausea, sometimes even vomiting, and that's a deal breaker, of course. Uh, diarrhea, or just a loosening of the bowels. On occasion, you can also see vivid dreams. That's why we try to give denepazil in the morning with food to reduce those vivid dreams. And then muscle cramps can also sometimes be a result of uh, that class of drugs. It's important to talk about all the support that's available uh, to those of us who uh, minister, who serve 
uh, Alzheimer's patients and their families. Here at Eden Hill, of course, we have a support group that's now via Zoom. Thanks to Iris Bowden. Thank you, Iris, for keeping that running. Uh, that meets the third Wednesday of the month at noon, and there are a variety of other Alzheimer's support groups in the community. Hope Hospice has those uh, groups. We're, we're privileged to, to partner with Hope Hospice and other organizations offering help, uh, of course, including the Alzheimer's Association. There are also some important um, works that I would recommend you take a look at. Coach Broyles' Playbook, this is a uh, a wonderful short guide to helping uh, manage demanding illness. The 36-hour day, many of you have heard of that book as well. That's really your reference book. I wouldn't suggest reading that cover to cover uh, because uh, it, uh, it really is pretty uh, meaty and weighty, you know, and if you, if you get too far ahead of yourself and you read about things that may or may not happen three, four, five years from now, I don't think that's terribly helpful, but you can use it as a reference. If you encounter a problem, it's easily indexed. So the 36-hour day is a, is a great resource as well. Well, um, thank you very much for uh, walking with me through this, through this journey. I know it was a, a rather dizzying pace. Um, I'll close with, uh, with a quote from one of my patients who had uh, a vascular dementia uh, near, the, uh, near the end of his life, and this was really a great a great source of um, comfort for his family. And he told his wife, he says, when I get to heaven, I'll have my mind back. Thanks again.